When our best fur friends leave our world, many of us are left wanting one last scritch, one last hug, one last walk together. One Last Network is a space for pet guardians to honor their pets in their senior years and to cope with the days leading up to and after their passing. Here's your host, Angela Schneider, founder of One Last Network and Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington. Welcome to One Last Network and the art of finding the love we deserve. Julie Schur has been a member of the LGBTQ2S plus community for more than 25 years. She has served the queer community in a number of ways, including educator, entertainer, and advocate. An expat American living in Spain, Julie seeks to continue uplifting her chosen family through mindset and growth coaching with a focus on grief. Along with her certification in coaching, she is accredited in cognitive behavioral therapy and rational emotive behavioral therapy. She also holds a master's in linguistics. The queer community is drastically underserved in so many ways. Its members face experiences that those who identify as non-queer will never understand. Those experiences often coupled with profound loss, can bring stress, grief, and lack of focus. Julie wants to help her community overcome those feelings and remind her family members that they have the strength to do so. I reached out to Julie because I have so many friends in the queer community, friends who have endured loss, friends who have endured the loss of pets. And I know from my own perspective how isolating grief and loss can be. But I want everyone to better understand the loneliness and isolation that our queer brothers and sisters experience when they say goodbye to their best fur friend. Have a listen. Good morning, Julie. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? Well, wait a second. It's good evening for you because you're in Spain. I am. And it is evening. Yeah. What an incredible place Spain must be. I've not been off the continent of North America, so I'm very jealous. Mm-hmm. You should visit. It's very nice. I would I would highly suggest a place with a beach. Maybe not Madrid, but Madrid is beautiful. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're, they're pros. It's the history that just has me so enthralled with it all. Yeah, it is, you know, coming from the U.S., it, it is a shock, you know, I mean, you know, that places older exist, but then you see, see that it, it's so common, you know, um, even just driving to the, like, there's a little city um, about 20 miles away. Um, and on the way there, you're passing castles, like remnants of castles that, you know, predate my entire, the entire US, you know, and it's, they're just, this is just there, you know, so it's kind of, it's, it's weird. It's strange. It's, it's beautiful, but it, it's a shock. Like it's hard to get used to. Right. Like this building is 1500 years old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. You can't even conceptualize that. Mm-hmm. But there yeah. it is. So you were a teacher here in the U S you are now a grief coach for the queer community. Tell us about that journey. Well, I'm actually a growth coach and I, I changed the wording a little bit because people were actually not understanding what I meant by grief. And we can go into that later. But um, I, I tend to, um, with my clients, I work with kind of all aspects of what they're going through. So growth coach in the sense of I help people who are stuck, who are trying to maybe achieve something um, find a better balance in their lives, but maybe they're kind of crippled by like just negative self-talk or, um, executive dysfunction. People who have some ADHD, um, you know, issues going on. I have ADHD myself. So, um, I help people find that, but also I consider the losses that our community carry with us, um, which, 
unfortunately they've been normalized. So, you know, if you don't deal with loss, it, it manifests in, in very um, powerful ways and very um, unhealthy ways in the future. Um, you know, if you don't ever address it, um, like if you lose your family and you're told, well, this is a normal part of coming out, um, you know, you just carry that loss along with you and you never talk about it. You never go to therapy. A lot of people can't afford therapy. Um, for it, I mean that can that can affect you later. That's huge loss. So I look at grief um, as you know anyone who has gone through a, a loss, and I don't really put a weight on those losses. You know, um, anything significant enough to impact your life is a loss. You know, um, you know especially for for the queer community, the LGBTQ community, um, loss of family, loss of freedom of jobs, loss of human rights, you know, loss of safety, just going to the store, these things pile up and they weigh on someone. Um, so that's kind of a long version of, of how um, I integrate that into helping people move forward. Um, but I actually transitioned from, um, in, the US, in the US, I, I taught for um, 16 years, um, I, I taught in both public schools and at the high school, K through 12. And then my last few years were university level. I taught English, linguistics, and composition. Um, and I liked the work. Uh, I continued it when I moved to Spain, but it always felt that something was missing. Um, <clears throat> and what I realized was, you know, all of those years I was hanging on for the students who would find me and kind of cling to me as a safe haven. And usually those were kids who were, um, they were marginalized in some way. Uh, most of the time they were members of the queer community and they would kind of gravitate to me. I never made it a conversation about um, who, how I identified. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm an adult, we're learning about composition, this is not a subject we need to discuss, but I also would never hide it, you know, it was not something to be ashamed of, but um, I ended up fighting for those kids in the schools, um, fighting the administrations a lot for, you know, maybe we could have a little GSA for, the, you know, maybe we could set something up to better support these students. Um, could we ask this person to stop dead naming my student, you know, et cetera. Um, just very small things. And what I found consistently, unfortunately, was that um, administrations would smile and nod and do absolutely nothing, which made me um, furious. And I was hanging on for those students every year. Um, and I was fighting for them. And the problem was that it was a, a battle that was impossible to fight, um, at least for me. I didn't have the power. I didn't have the clout. I, I didn't have the voice loud enough that they would listen. Um, and so it was just, it was crushing me watching that happen. Um, so I tried to figure out how, without going back to school for, you know, 10 years, I could help the, the LGBTQ community um, other than being an advocate, which, you know, many of us are in the ways we can be. But um, I, I wanted to give in some way because that fills my soul. And I stumbled across coaching, which to me sounded a little goofy, you know, because coaches got kind of a bad reputation for a while there. But, you know, um, I found a school that actually has a certification process. We have to take an ethics, you know, courses on ethics. Um, it's essentially aligned with HIPAA. Um, I opted for a, a little pricier program because uh, once I had that certification, I am actually reportable. So if I do something that is outside the ethical guidelines, um, I can be reported. And I did that because I, with especially working with the queer community, being a part of the queer community and working for them um, and with them, um, I want to set a baseline of, you know, the trust. Um, I am safe. And if, you know, if I happen to not be in some way, um, I can be shut down completely. Um, so 
I went with that and I'm, I'm newish in this. I've only been, um, I was certified in just the, the last week of January. I've kind of been putting word out. I have a few clients now and I've had a few clients that I've, you know, worked with before, um, it, from February to May. Um, but yeah, I'm still, I'm still growing and, you know, as most of us should do, I'm continuously trying to learn and find better methods to, to use and better techniques for my clients. And, um, right now I use a lot, it's individualized, but I use a lot of CBT and REBT, uh, therapy techniques. Um, I'm certified in both of those. Um, so I can work with, uh, a client, if that's what they need, we can integrate that into the, the process. If they don't need that, we don't. So. You mentioned some of the specific types of loss that the members of the queer community endure. Speaking as part of the cishet dominant world, we may not conceive of the effect that might have those specific losses might have on a member of the queer community. Can you speak more to um, what that's like to, to have sure. those losses like family and, and jobs and stuff like that? Sure. Um, I can speak only uh, because, you know, we're not a monolith, but I will speak for myself and those friends that I do know. I know, you know, not every member of the community is in the same position, but I do know a lot of people who have gone through these things. And I myself uh, had a very rough path of it. Um, uh, you know, the losses that I see that are most overwhelming and most common, unfortunately, um, would be uh, the loss of family, isolation from family. Um, if, uh, if that doesn't exist, uh, people are very lucky in that sense. And, and I do think they know that because it is pretty prevalent. Um, prevalent enough where those who have their family around say, I'm lucky to have my family, which is not a statement you make in a community that mostly keeps their families. Um, the loss of friend groups, um, the sense of isolation, the loss of a feeling of community, just being in a group of other human beings, uh, just because of the prevailing thoughts about who and what this is, which are um, wildly incorrect for, in most cases, um, the loss of a feeling of security. Um, I mean, imagine um, needing to go to Target and just grab a few things. Um, I personally, and and I, I present in a way that is very difficult to hide who I am. I don't do this for attention. I do this because this is who I am. This is how I feel good. Um, I look very strange with long hair, trust me. And it is my high school senior pictures are horrific. They, no one, they, I need to burn them, but I keep them around for jokes, you know. Um, oh, and it was the 80s. Don't, don't they all look terrible? Oh, hey, now it was not mine. was not the 80s. I'm not that old yet. Now I'm okay. I'm not, okay, fine. It was late. It was the late 90s. Thank you. But no, no, just me with hair. Oh, um, geez. um, Honestly, I think my my dog would look better with a wig on, like just much more attractive. So it 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 looks it's awkward. It's awkward. But anyway, um, the point is, I I don't. I had to kind of mentally put on my armor before I would go to Target, and you know that's 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 wild, you know, because um I was mentioning before, you know, when we met, you know, um, it's it's just every day someone would say something and maybe it's just one word, but you know, when you're shopping for, you know, I'm picking up apples or, you know, getting detergent and someone has a slur and they say it when they walk by or they grab their child and they pull them away from me really quickly, you know, that, that stabs you in the heart, you know? So I'd say that's, that's a sort of loss because that is a safety and that, that should be afforded to all human beings just to exist. Um, a, uh, a lot of things, uh, we, we lose job possibilities because, um, many of us, especially those of us who don't pass quite so easily or, um, have pronouns that are they, them, or not the, the standard 
more accepted she, her, he, him, um, we kind of have to think about what we are going to put on a resume. Um, we may lose a dream job or have to abandon it just because we know that company is inherently anti-gay um, at the top, at the CEO level, um, which makes it unsafe for us. Um, yeah, there are a lot of losses. And, you know, when you when you look at loss in, in the sense of the traditional sense, like um, losing a loved one, mm-hmm. Um, and you don't deal with that loss, which my argument is most of most of the community hasn't because we've been told um, it is part of the coming out process to be expected. So we kind of accept that as something we have to endure to come out and then we move forward and we never look back. But, you know, that as with any loss, um, it affects your brain. Uh, it affects the way um, it so if you look at someone who has lost a loved one and they go through, you know, the process of guilt, of grief, um, there are, you know, the, the stages that have kind of not really, aren't really accepted anymore because there's a lot, it's, it's simplistic, but after about six months, you know, if there's no progress forward and you haven't dealt with it, you've actually kind of carved a neural network into your head of, of seeking that which you cannot attain, which actually triggers dopamine receptors to give you dopamine for a negative action. So the more you walk that path through the neural network, like your that neural pathway, it's like a path in a field. It gets deeper and deeper. It gets more ingrained and more ingrained. And you know the same centers are activated with every kind of loss. And it's the centers for um, pursuit of something of the desire for something. And the problem is it's something that we cannot have. A loved one back or Mm. human rights or safety when we go to the store or our family back in our life, they're gone. But something in us keeps trying to get them. And what that does over time to someone, let's talk traditionally, someone who's lost a family member, the symptoms of complex grief or prolonged grief um, it, our, our lack of focus, trouble sleeping, um, brain fog, insomnia, anxiety, depression. Um, there are physical symptoms as well. It just IBS, uh, high blood pressure, you know, I mean, these are real symptoms that people suffer when they lose a loved one and, and aren't able to move past that grief. And that's not their fault that they can't move past it because as I mentioned before, therapy is expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's also an undertaking that is painful because you have to discuss and you have to work and you have to push through. And that is not always the easiest path. Sometimes pushing it to the back of your mind is the easiest path. But in the long term, that is the the harshest path. It does the most damage. Um, So I'm equating those two as, as equals, honestly, because a loss is a loss. It does the same thing to the brain as any other loss. Uh, and over time, it has the same effects, the negative effects, um, the negative self-talk, the viewing yourself as less than, um, that can all come when a person dies and it can all also come with a large loss in your life, uh, whether that be a community, um, family, et cetera. Walking the journey of being a member of the queer community sounds like it can be very lonely and isolating. Throw grief and loss, which in and of themselves are can be lonely and isolating, into the mix. It all becomes rather compounded, doesn't it? It can, but I will say one thing. Um, I did essentially lose my, my family. Um, when I came out, I was raised, um, in a very religious home. I reconnected with a few members and that that's good, but I will never reconnect to the level that I wish I could, because I know that the acceptance is not 100%. I don't feel safe to talk about certain things, uh, because I don't want to face what could possibly be said. 
That said, the queer community is my family. Um, and it is for a lot of people um, who have gone through what I've gone through. Um, <clears throat> I did have a point in my life where due to trying to be who I am, which it is, I would like to just reiterate for anyone who doubts that, not a choice because I would not choose this uh, path um, unless it was authentic and worth it because it is not easy. And um, it is full of people who would like me to not exist anymore, but also I know who I am and I'm confident in who I am. And honestly, it, it really has very little to do with who is or is not in my bed. If there is no one there, I am still this person. Um, so just clarifying that, but, you know, I did end up living in my car for a bit. And, you know, the point there is that the people who offered me a room, um, you know, to, to rent very cheaply and first in exchange for just help around the house and help me get a job and get on my feet after that, in the aftermath of admitting to the world who I was, which was terrifying. Um, were members of the queer community. Um, and from there, it just grew. And there's safety there. As with any group of human beings, there's fighting and there's disagreements and people <laughs> don't like each other, you know. But the thing is, no matter where you go in the world, you have a common bond with a group of people. Um, and there are different levels of understanding of the experiences, et cetera, you know. I mean, of course, because we're all different, but it can be isolating, but at the same time, it's not because um, I could reach out to a group of people and say, hey, you know, a group of queer folks and online or otherwise or in person say, hey, you know, I'm I'm a member of the community. I'm feeling very down. I'm feeling like I don't belong. Um, you know, could I get some uplifting something? And I'm going to get uplifting words and encouragement from people I've never met before. Um, and you know, we, we do hold each other up. So it can be isolating in a sense, but if you realize the vast number of us out there, um, who are beautiful people, I'm not saying every one of us is because every one of any group is not beautiful. That is ridiculous. This is the world. Um, you know, there are very nice people in my community and there are very, Oh, there are some not so nice people. But since the community has been vilified to the point of that it has been, I do want to point out that, you know, our community has some some power. You know, there are some decision makers, a lot of leaders, a lot of people in the healing fields, a lot of people who are very, very compassionate, caring, loving, would do anything for a person just so that they didn't feel the way that they feel every day. And after they've been through what they've been through, I feel like that is like a superpower. So sometimes isolating, but usually not because I know where I can reach out. I know, I know I've got a built in family, even if I don't know them and I've never met them, they're my family. So that's beautiful. And let's segue into the main theme of one last network and that's of course pets mm -hmm. tell me about your dog which one uh, all of them <laughs> well i'm guessing there is going to be waterworks you know that so yeah <laughs> um well um my first dog, I was 23 and I decided, oh, I'm going to get a dog. Why not? I'm going to go to the shelter, get a dog. And, oh, that was 2003, that dog. <laughs> and it was just love at first sight. It was just a little sad, sweet puppy. It was three months old. And so I, I adopted him. Um, well, I had to go back because they just brought him in. Uh, he had a little white heart on his tummy, like a little white heart marking, I remember. And I was like, he's like a Care Bear. I'm going to get him. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I was getting ready to leave on a road trip around the U.S. as 20-year-olds do sometimes, you know. Um, so 
I wasn't worried about it, you know, so I, I went back to get him. They had switched the kennels and they were trying to tell me another dog was him. And I was like, it's not him. There's no heart on his tummy. That's him over there. I found him. I argued with him. I got my boy. We left. Um, so that was um, in, yeah, March of March of 2023. Um, so yeah, he was, a, he ended up being just a, my sole dog. Um, he, he replaced, he made up for every bit of family I ever lost. He took care of me when I was upset. He traveled around at one point I was a musician. I used to drive everywhere. So it did get lonely then. Um, but he was with me. He went with me everywhere. Um, he was amazingly smart. And, um, when he got older, um, he was a shepherd mix. 55 pound dog. Um, he, I developed anxiety when I was driving. I, it started to get really bad. My anxiety started getting, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty bad when I was older. And I noticed he started pawing me on the shoulder while we were driving. And I was like, I don't know what this is, but it started to, I started to realize not 10 minutes later, I'd have an anxiety attack. That was horrible. He'd only do it right before. And I realized this was a pattern and it kept up for, for quite a while. So he ended up, um, my doctor actually ended up, you know, I'm sure people will get upset with this, but um, because he was alerting me to when I needed to take my medicine, uh, because if I take my my medicine before, before that, I will usually be okay. Um, he was actually letting me know. So, you know, he, he served me in so many ways. And yeah. that was a, uh, something my, you know, my doctor was like, you got really lucky that he just is noticing this and has found a way to consistently, you know, alert you. Um, you know, I didn't take him into source or anything because that's not where my anxiety happened. Um, mm -hmm. so, but he was, he was my caretaker and I was his and, um, came to Spain with me, um, towards the end of his life. He, you know, got osteoarthritis and I pulled him around in a cart, uh, through Spain in a, he, he would just hang his little head out the cart and look at everybody, you know, oh, I mean, he was a big boy. So, you know, his big head out of the cart. And, um, I, uh, he was with me for 17 years and three months and wow. his, yeah, they told me, oh, well you take really good care of him. So he'll probably make it to 13. So I was, I was what's, the luckiest. What's his name? Avery. He's gone. Hmm. He's not a part of our physical world anymore, right? No. What was it like for you to lose him? Crushing. Mm -hmm. The hardest, the hardest moment of my life, definitely. Worse than losing my family because he was with me longer than they were. I left home at, I was a little over 16. He was with me 17 years and, and three months. So he was a bigger part of my life than my family was, but he's still with me. I know he's still with me. Absolutely. That is well, one of the things that his I sister teach. Up. <laughs> Oh What's yeah. That? His sister showed up on accident. Um, oh. it's, it's not his actual sister, but you know, I'm in Spain and my ex-wife was like trying to distract me by going to look at puppies. And I was like, it's too soon. It's been six months. I don't want another dog. This is terrible you know, go away. And she convinced me to go look at a dog at a shelter. And I was like, fine, I'll foster her. So I got there and there's this long, lanky looking dog that is hiding from everybody and getting run over by all the dogs and just horrified of everything that moved, every sound, everything. Um, and you know, they were like, oh, she's very anxious. You don't want that one. And that was kind of the moment for me. I was like, oh, I don't want that one because she's anxious and I have horrible anxiety. So um, I had to fight with a really bad shelter to actually get them to turn the papers over to me. Um, they kind of threatened and did some weird things. Um, but she's my my girl now she's been with me for three years and about two months after i adopted her i finally got all of her papers and the reason i say she's his sister is because um the first night she stayed with me 
first night, um, she found his favorite toy, which I couldn't find anywhere. And she laid it where he had been sleeping on the floor. And I found it when I woke up. Oh, I cried. I cried. I, I had took a picture of it because I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh, no, I'm losing. I've, I've lost it now because I'm imagining this. And then when I got the paperwork that they mailed to me, because every dog here has a booklet um, to keep all their immunizations, their microchip numbers, everything. Um, when I got it, um, I looked at the date of birth. I'm going to cry. So uh, Avery died on March 25th of 2020. Cora was born on March 25th of 2020. Oh, damn. I see. Yeah. You. Yeah. Um, and there's no way that shelter knew. Um, my, my ex didn't know the exact day because it was the pandemic. We weren't living together. There's no way she would remember that, uh, that date. Um, and that shelter had no idea. They knew I'd owned a dog before. They knew that I had, I hate owned, but they knew I'd had a dog before. Um, that is all I knew because they asked, do you have experience with dogs? And I said, yes, I, I had an out, you know, a dog for a long time. That's all I told them. And they said, oh, she was born around April sometime. And I was like, oh, okay, she was born in the spring. And when I got the paperwork, March 25th, 2020, the exact day he left. So, you know, I... <laughs> I know he's, I know he's around. I know he sent her, you know, she, and she's a very anxious dog and she's on medication for her, her level of fear. So I don't have to carry a 75 pound, very strong dog inside and outside anymore, which I did in the beginning. I was carrying her because she would freeze from the fear. Uh, she was abused horribly before I got her. Um, she does not like people or other dogs, but she is a good, good, sweet girl and she loves me. So that's really all that matters. There's a universality in the pet community. And we understand that our companion animals bring us comfort and joy and companionship. Do you feel that there's a different level of that when it comes to being a member of the queer community and having a pet? You know, it, that's a really hard thing to comment on. because I don't want to take away from any community's level of love for their pet because yeah. I know how much people who truly love their pet, love their pets. So to say that it's somehow like more um, is kind of like um, a slap in the face to anyone in the cis pet community um, or not my community who also loves their dog to an insane extent <laughs> like I did. Um, but I would say, honestly, maybe they are representative of something more. Um, and I don't mean that as a slight to anybody else's love, but for their pets. but. Um, I think that can be said for anyone who's maybe, you know, regardless of the community they're in, uh, but anybody who's faced a lot of loss, I think that having a pet can fill the space that that loss left. Um, so, you know, when you're, when you're talking in a very general sense, um, groups of people who have lost a lot uh, may look at their pets in a different way because that pet can, um, it can fill and heal some of those losses. You know, um, I know for me, just speaking only for myself, uh, that Avery, my, my boy filled a space that was left just a big, horrible hole that was left when I, I, you know, came out the friends who left the family that left. Um, all of that love that I was once given was withdrawn just because I said, you know, I'm the same person, but this is who I've been hiding. You know, this is what I, I didn't want to tell you because I was scared of how you react. And the reaction was, I mean, my fears were confirmed, but the thing is my dog didn't care. My dog didn't care. He, he saw, you know, I, I gave him love. He gave me love. I took good care of him. He took care, good care of me. And 
you know, where I normally would have given that love to family and friends, um, they weren't there. So I gave it to him. So he was spoiled beyond belief. That boy got everything he ever wanted. And this girl gets everything, you know, with a healthy degree, obviously, but you know, um, and I no think judgment. that no, yeah, judgment. no, no, no. <laughs> no um, keeping them healthy at the same time. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't want to, again, I don't want to, you know, downplay any, anyone's love for their, their pet, because I, I feel like that's, that's not at all fair to say that, you know, because I'm queer, I love my dog more is, is weird. I could never say that. Uh, but I can say that it filled losses uh, that I know other people may not have gone through. Um, I think anybody who's experienced a level of, of loss, like those of us, comparative to those of us in my community, um, may may feel a greater sense of pain and grief when their pet leaves, uh, just because that pet was representative of those losses. It filled the hole that those losses left. And when that new loss happens, it is just, it's, it is a powerful thing to get through. It is a, it is a tough road to get through that. In my other life as a professional dog photographer, I had a client come to me in 2020 on the last day of his dog's life. And he was telling me how that he had had that dog since he was mid teens and that dog comforted him through his coming out phase and through navigating university life. And of course, losing that dog was absolutely devastating to him because it's sig because Dexter signaled to him all of the comfort that he yeah needed through those stages yeah i i i understand that i understand that pain and that level of loss yeah and it's um, not any of which i can conceive because no matter what messed up relationship i may have had with my parents i didn't go through that it's you know, when, when no one else on earth, or it feels like, you know, when it feels like you haven't yet met your community, you haven't yet met your people, what, whatever it may be, um, you know, when there is no one else and, and you are afraid to talk about whatever it might be, whether, you know, whether it's I'm gay or I'm bi or, you know, or, or I, I'm really down and I can't tell this to my, your pets don't judge you. This is the thing. When when you're being judged by everything, and if no one is personally judging you, you turn on the television and everyone there is judging you. And your existence is a debate topic on every news network you, you come to, every political arena is discussing whether or not you deserve to live. I mean, hmm. and then you turn to this creature who does not care what you look like, what you, they they love you. They love you. The end. Yes, that is, you know, people who say it's just a dog <laughs> <laughs> I have a charmed, charmed life. I couldn't, I would not want that thought in my head. I don't understand that kind of sentiment because I don't think those are people who interact with that pet because my, my boy and my girl, you know, they, you know how a dog looks at you. It is just complete acceptance. And for some, when, when anyone, queer community or otherwise, when you don't see that look in another human's eyes, you will take it where it comes. And humans, I feel like we need to, we need to learn a lot from animals. You know, I mean, animals don't do things purely to hurt people uh, other than maybe orcas, but you know, like I, they just have fun with those boats and those seals. They, they can be mean, but for the most part, animals are acting on an, on, you know, just it's, it's something that has to happen, you know? Um, but my boy, he didn't care. And that, you know, was what mattered to me. I would come home at the end of the day and 
he didn't question what I was wearing. He didn't ask who I talked to. He didn't, you know, ask me when I was going to go back to church. He didn't ask X, Y, and Z of me. He was just, oh, hey, you're home. I'm, I'm really happy to see you. And that level of love is honestly what all of us deserve. Just, you know, I've missed you. I'm so glad you're back. Like, why can't we expect the same from people? You know, I mean, that's such a simple thing. But it's so rare that it's a beautiful, you know, like it's so rare that we 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 hold it up. But, you know, we should because it's beautiful. When you said goodbye to Avery, were you able to lean on your community? Unfortunately, not a lot. I did online because I, I was in Spain then and the pandemic was at full blast and um, it was March. So it, it hit Spain uh, really, really hard um, late February. So we were in uh, we were in the you literally can't go outside during during most hours without a massive fine kind of thing, uh, because uh, Spain has because of the I think it's because of the healthcare system. Uh, there's a very large, very elderly population uh, who are in pretty good health, um, but they're susceptible to, to COVID. Um, and we lost, uh, Spain lost a massive amount of elderly folks. So, you know, we weren't able to leave our buildings. I wasn't able to leave my apartment unless it was the, um, the hours that uh, there were certain hours of the day I was allowed to go outside. Uh, it was to keep elderly folks away from the main carriers. Um, elderly people were allowed to go out during certain hours and they were different hours than children and adults um, to keep the, the risk lower uh, and try to try to minimize the, the deaths, which it did very little to, to curb, honestly, um, because we're kind of stacked here um, in, in apartments. It's hard. Um, but I, I did lean on my community um, through Facebook, fortunately, and the outpouring I got uh, because I, I, I did travel with him um, as a musician for a long time. So many people had met Avery um, that I think was the most commented on post I've ever put on anything on social media in my life. Um, everybody, everyone who had ever met him was just leaving words of love. And, you know, that, that meant a lot to me, you know, for people to just say, I'm sorry. And he was such a good boy, you know, because, you know, he was, he was the best boy. I mean, everybody's is the best, but he was my best, you know, but I mean, definitely I, I did get to be there. Um, the one good thing about it being the pandemic was that the vet that he had came to the house. Um, and he was able to stay at home and I was able to hold him, um, and sing to him. So, okay. yeah. Are those stories of, have those stories of Avery helped you heal? You know, I, you see my eyes. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, you know, we, the grief doesn't get smaller. We just, we, we get bigger, you know, we make more, we, we, we grow you know, um, oh, I love and, that. uh, mm. so, you know, like it, people who are expecting the pain to go away, it, it's, it's not gonna, but you're going to grow stronger. So the pain's going to seem smaller. The pain is not going to get smaller. You're just going to get a lot stronger. Um, and you're going to be able to handle it better. Um, it's been over three years. Um, you know, and the stories of him do help because I, now, in the beginning, no, because it's a process. You know, you you have to, you know, with my clients, I tell them, you know, you have to go through this process, you know, and it's going to look different for everyone. Um, there are no, the stages of grief are kind of, you know, not necessarily true. You know, this, this linear motion through one step, one step, two step, three. No, it's step one, then back, and then step five, I'm over it, and then it's crying in a bathroom. This is, it's not reasonable to think that human grief can go through a, a very pointed process. You know, it's hard, but, you know, you realize one day that you're able to, to remember them without crying. You're able to talk about them without crying. And you start remembering with a smile on your face instead of like crumpled over in a corner, 
with your friends asking you if you're okay, you know, like, and, you know, um, I try to tell my clients to, you know, um, and I call them clients, just, it sounds so clinical, but, you know, people I work with, um, when, when we're talking about feelings that are that powerful, you know, one of the, the tips I can give that, you know, sounds a little silly, but is to, it's to tell it, it belongs, you know, um, if you fight that feeling of sadness or anger that your pet is gone, it, you're battling with yourself. It's, it's a battle. You're not going to win. Ex just recognize the feeling and let it exist because it, to get to the other side of it, you have to go through it. You can't jump over it. You can't shove it in the background and you can, but it will come back. And trust me, I'm just speaking from experience. It will come back because I went, I went just, I tried to turn myself into a stone when I lost him because I thought I am going to crumble. And you know what? I did, I did crumble. I did crumble. Um, but I'm here <laughs> and, you know, I, I have this picture sitting on the, right across from me on the um, mantle and well, on the TV stand, there are no mantles. Um, you know, it's a process and it's hard, but, you know, honoring them by remembering and, and going through that pain, you know, it's, it's honoring them because they want, you know, your pet would want you to move forward um, because they always loved you, you know, they always loved you. And so you have to accept those feelings and tell them that they belong there and then move through them and let them happen. And things do get better. What can healthcare professionals do better to understand the issues around pet loss grief with respect to the queer community? Well, with respect to the queer community, I have a lot to say on what healthcare providers could do better. They could understand what the queer community goes through, first of all. They could recognize that we're human beings with the same wants and loves and needs and pains as everyone else. Um, so once they do that and see us as human, um, I would say that I would recommend they do what they do with anybody and recognize the loss of a pet as, as significant as any other loss and not downplay it as it's just a dog. It's just a cat you'll get through it. It's fine. Because a lot of, I think a lot, and I'm not, I'm not speaking of any of the healthcare providers I know and that I care about or have worked with because they, they would not say those things, but I know a lot of, a lot of, I know a lot who would. Um, I think maybe not downplaying someone's grief in any situation is the best call for any healthcare provider, especially when it comes to mental health care providers. Um, I think that, um, to say that something we're going through, which is something that is done to the queer community a lot. Oh, oh, well, you know, you lost your family. Well, you came out. What do you expect? You know, I mean, oh, you lost your pet. Oh, you're sad. Oh, you'll be fine. It's a dog. These I feel are on the same level of, of, I'm not going to use the language I'd like to use right now. Um, but they're on the same level of just being horrific. Um, you have to, if someone is feeling very strongly about something, then that is valid. Um, everybody handles things differently. Everybody has different levels of what they can deal with and what they can't. And if it's very painful for someone to lose a pet, then that makes it valid. Then you need to help that person with the level of pain they have. Um, maybe some people will get through it a lot easier than others. And that doesn't mean that it's not painful, but maybe they get through it better than others. And that's great for them. Some people have, are just, it's like they got hit by a vehicle and that's valid too. And that people need to be met where they are and respected and not seen as something to the, oh, you're being dramatic and being brushed away. I think that would, that would be a very, if people would take others feeling seriously, that would be the first step. What can allies do better? What can allies do better? As far as pet loss or just the queer community? Yes. 
<laughs> Allies. Mm, I'm going to speak directly just to. Please. A lot of us are losing faith in you because honestly, we're seeing you not go out and vote when our lives are at stake. We're seeing you not speak up when someone says something homophobic at, in a large group. We're seeing you quietly support us. And right now we don't need quiet. Um, there's a quote that says, if you are an ally and you're not close enough to get hit by the rocks they're throwing, you're not close enough. Um, please speak up. You know, it. I know it's hard to get involved, especially in a country, if you're listening from the US, especially when you know that half the people around you are carrying a weapon, please don't put yourself in an unsafe position. But if it just means being uncomfortable, please. If someone is, is being transphobic or homophobic in a group setting at work, um, anywhere, you know, please say something, call it out. Because if the person standing behind you is a member of my community and they are on the edge of what they can handle being in this world, hearing you say something in their defense, you could save their life. And I, I mean, I know that sounds dramatic, but I have been that person standing behind someone. So you don't know how powerful your words are. And you might think it's such a small thing. Why would I say anything? Because who's around you? Who's going to hear you? Please. You know, if you love someone who is queer, trans, you know, maybe you suspect they are. Please say something. Speak out against homophobia and, and transphobia because um, honestly, you are you are safe. You are a lot safer than we are. Um, you have the privilege to open your mouth um, and say those things without being possibly killed in the parking lot later or followed home or being um, attacked online um, to an extent that, you know, your mental health is in, in, in a horrible state. So please say something, please stand close enough that you're hit with what we're hit with um, because, you know, we need you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> we've got a, you know, we've got a road out here. Um, we need you really, really badly. So please vote. Please, please fight against um, the things you see happening. Um, because seeing you fight gives us the hope to keep fighting. And a lot of us are, are running low on that. Um, it's exhausting to wake up every day and feel like you have to fight uh, everyone just to make it through your day. You know. Um, and to those of you who are already doing that, thank you so much. You you have no idea the impact it makes. Maybe maybe no one fabulous has come up to you and thrown glitter at you and said, you know, some queer catchphrase. But this is me throwing glitter at you and and saying, yes, you're fabulous. I'm going to appropriate that from the gay men and the black community right now. I'm sorry, uh, but you know, it is the it is the you know the drag queen catchphrase that we love. So all the glitter I can possibly take, please. I'm I'm throwing so much glitter right now. Thank you so much for 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 standing with us. And please do that not just for the queer community. Please do that for the black community as well, um, because you know the queer community are not the only ones who are being attacked. Um, it's just the loudest fight right now. Um, but you know the the black man the black community and the queer community we we have a lot of crossover so you know please please stand up for marginalized folks you know because we see it and we hear it and we appreciate that I'm speaking for me I I hear it and I see it and I appreciate it and you know the strangers I see standing against the transphobic marches and that you, you know I will I, I wish I could hug every one of those people I can't <laughs> but I would. You know, and I, I know I speak for a lot of people when I say that. Why is it then so important that you exist in this world as a growth and mindset coach for the LGBT community? Hmm. Um, I think it's important just because I am, I feel everybody should be their authentic self. 
and they should follow what fills their soul. And because we, you know, we have one life and I'm trying to do the most with mine that I can. And for me, that means being authentic to myself and being authentic to what feels like my calling and what, what feels like I'm supposed to do. Um, so existing as a growth and mindset coach for the queer community, what I'm trying to do is uh, create a safe space where there is literally, there's no judgment. There is no implicit bias. No microaggressions will be popping up uh, in the conversation. You don't have to worry about me mentioning, uh, maybe you should try, you know, um, religious organization or ex I, I will not gloss, gloss over the fact that you are a member of the community because that I feel is part of, you know, what makes you you. You are respected, accepted, and loved, and you are my family. And um, as someone who identifies as non-binary, I, I do understand how hard it can be to wonder, to sit across from someone and try to be vulnerable while wondering if they're judging you or even without knowing, maybe, maybe, maybe they're trying to figure out what I am right now. You know, that's a, that's a feeling that shouldn't creep in when you're trying to be vulnerable when you're trying to solve things that have nothing to do with that really, you know, well, tangentially, but when you're trying to work on your work-life balance in be authentic and, and honest about what's going on at your house, you don't want to tiptoe around the fact that, um, you know, you call your partner they, and re oh, I, you don't want to wonder, should I clarify this for the person I'm talking to? Not with me. No, you should not. Um, I, I thought that this was maybe a valuable thing um to try to do because i have i've experienced a lot of um just homophobia with mental health care providers and and it wasn't blatant but it was you know it's they're little microaggressions that pop out they're just things that people don't even realize are offensive are said and i i understand because you know you can you can understand someone you can look at someone you can learn about someone that is not like you until you know your dying day you can you can be their ally but unless you have walked that walk and lived that life you will never know the feeling and the, you'll never know the intensity that that can can carry that you'll never truly truly understand um for instance, I mean, I support Black Lives Matter, but I would never say I understand what the Black community is going through. No, I don't. No, I don't. Because when I drive my car, I have a, I don't have a set an entire set of worries that a Black man would have when driving that car. So yes, I can stand with the Black community, but I cannot understand. So people who stand with the queer community, I appreciate and love those people. But there is a limit to the level of understanding that can happen. Um, so I feel like people who are maybe a little bit. Some people may find a little more comfort talking to someone who is also a member of their community, who has also faced trauma and loss. Um, and, you know, that that can be that can be a comfort in itself. I don't know if it's an important, you know, I want to say it's important. You asked me, why is it important that I'm in the world, uh, in the world as this? Um, I think just in general, because I'm living my truth and I think everybody should try to do that. Um, and I'm trying to make a difference. I'm trying to strengthen the community, uh, one person at a time, uh, because the more, the more people we have who are, are calm and settled and feel more confident, um, you know, the better I'm trying to hold up a mirror to people to remind them of the strength they have. And I think that some of the strongest people in the world are in my community because to live day after day like this and keep going, oh, the strength. And I, I admire and love and respect that so much in my family. Um, and I try to show them those qualities because we forget we have those. And I can hold up a mirror that is clean because I am not in the middle of it. I can see it sometimes more clearly than you. What are some books or other resources that um, people in your community can lean on when they're in times of grief, possibly especially pet loss grief? Hmm. 
that's really difficult because I think it it kind of I usually don't send people to to books. Uh, I know there are a lot of good books out there. I don't have like a list of them though, um, because a lot of times when you're in that place, I encourage people to kind of get out of like not sit and maybe that's a, how if you deal with grief better in that way to sit quietly and kind of maybe that's what some people want. Uh, me personally, I find that that actually makes me worse. Uh, because it gives me too much time to think. Um, I'm, uh, I have, I mentioned before I have ADHD, so I, I tend to sit and hyper focus on things that are not always very good for me. Um, and a lot of my clients are in the same space, in the same place. Um, so I don't necessarily suggest books. I think if you do a Google search on that, you could find some things. But what I suggest um, is trying to connect with community, really. Um, and if you don't feel like leaving the house which I know a lot of people don't after losing a loved one, which is exactly what it is. It's not a pet. It's a loved one. Mm -hmm. It's your family. Excuse me. Um, if you can't force yourself to leave the house, that's fine. That's fine. Um, go on Facebook. Um, you know, go on, it, just go on, go look on Eventbrite and type in the word queer. If you're a queer person and look for events, there are a lot, sometimes there are coffee, there are chats, with random people and they just talk about things and come together as community on zoom. Um, I would go on Facebook, join a community group, um, that, that matches what you need, maybe loss or something. Um, best though, you know, reach out to the friends, you know, see a pet as more than just a pet, you know, more than just a dog, reach out to those people and, and just talk about anything you can, you know, um, maybe not the pet at that moment. Um, you know, especially if it's fresh, you know, try to try to just surround yourself with people who support you, whatever that looks like for you. I feel like moving forward is such an individual thing. It's really hard for me to give advice that is a blanket it, that works for everyone because it, it rarely does. I, I initially thought, oh, I'll learn these things and it'll work for everyone. No, that's not true. We are all too different. Um, and that is beautiful. Um, if you do something and it gives you a spark of joy in that moment, or you feel the weight of that sadness, lift just a tiny bit, do that thing again. Um, I also suggest people to, you know, to go take a walk. It, a five minute walk is still a walk. If that's all you can manage and be gentle with yourself. I, this isn't really a walk. I just walked around the, the corner and then back. That's a walk. You did it. Um, and you were out of the space, you were having that sadness in for a moment, removing that place where you're suffering, leaving that place for just a little bit can make a big impact, even if it's just for a few minutes. Um, so I, I try to encourage people not to isolate because I, I made that mistake. Um, and I know that can be very, very damaging. It allows the intrusive, the negative thoughts to grow and just the focus on that, you know, and if you are going to isolate yourself, find a good series that is somehow uplifting or just so dumb that you you would never watch it. Honestly, find some reality TV. It will make you feel better about yourself. Just, you know, and you don't have to think, you don't have to focus. You can zone out. There are sounds around you that are distracting you. You know, it's keep your mind a little bit busy if you can. And I know it's hard when you're going through that level of loss. It was very hard for me. Yeah. It, if you're looking for something binge worthy that will make you feel better about yourself, I highly recommend the Love is Blind series on Netflix. Oh, I yeah. No, I unfortunately, yes. I went through a very low point in my mental health. And let me tell you, I felt so much better about myself. After I was like, okay, you know what? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. So, and I, and by that, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but you know, like so just, just chasing after someone who treats you horribly. No, I'm not, I was like, okay, things are bad, but I could be worse. Like, you know, reality TV can help with that a lot, unfortunately, I, but yeah, love is blind. I, the I, ultimatum I, is also quite yes. dramatic over the top even, yeah. but it will distract you. You will not 
you will lose brain cells. I'm sorry, you will. They brain cells will shrivel up, but you're not thinking about the sad thing, which is good to not focus on that too much. At least in the in the very in the very not for a bit. You're based in Spain. Are you available to work with anyone anywhere in the world? I actually am. I only live in Spain. I work, um, my clients I, are primarily um, in the U.S. and the U.K. So, yes, my, I, I work, um, my level of Spanish is decent, but because I believe um, I'm not working with the Spanish community yet because I feel like um, with coaching, you need to understand the nuances of language because you're dealing with feelings and emotions. And I am not, I need to get a little bit better first um, or else I might miss important things. And also with coaching, you use the phone uh, because what I do at least, um, because you, I attune myself to kind of notice subtle shifts in tone um, because that can signal maybe something someone doesn't want to talk about or something someone's kind of omitting or maybe, you know, with tone, you can hear, okay, someone's saying they love something, but that is not a voice that reflects that they love it. We'll dive deeper in that point. Um, so that makes it very hard with a language barrier as well, at least even a small language barrier. So yes, I actually, I do work uh, primarily with the US, uh, but also I have some clients from the UK as well. Julie, what is one last piece of advice you can give our listeners? Mm. Let yourself be yourself. Um, if you, I know that sounds silly and maybe it doesn't make sense. Um, but if you are falling apart because you lost a pet, that's valid and be gentle with yourself. It's okay. You know, um, if, if you feel like maybe you aren't what those around you, you're, if you feel like your true self wouldn't be accepted by those around you, whatever that might look like or be, I would highly encourage you to take the step and be who you are. Um, because the people you lose in the end, um, it's not, it's, it's not worth losing yourself. You know, um, it's for those who have lost a pet, um, keep your head up as much as that sounds callous, but, please keep moving forward. I know that the anger and the grief and the despair that you feel um, is normal. It's part of you healing. Um, your pet is still with you in a way because they live in your heart and they live in your memories and you made their life better, just like they made yours better. Um, and you can, no one can take that from you. Um, the pain will become bearable and you will come through it. Um, and I, I believe that you will. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're feeling like people around you won't accept you for whatever reason, um, find better people. Um, it doesn't matter if, if that's, if you're, if you're, you think you might be queer, if you think you might be trans, um, you know, if, if, if I'm not even just talking about that, you know, maybe Maybe you want to be a doctor and everybody in your family wants you to, you know, be a lawyer. Those are very, go, go be what you want to be. This is your life. And, you know, you, you end up trading for other people's approval. Don't trade yourself for that uh, because this, it's not a, it's not a payment you can afford. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Julie, one last thing. Tell us where in the world to find you. Oh, um, well, people can email me at coachjuliesher at gmail.com. Um, it's just Coach Julie, J-U-L-I-E. And my last name is fun. It's S-C-H-U-R-R at gmail.com. So if anybody has any questions or anything or just wants to talk, um, the first call with a coach with most coaches is free. So uh, mine is. Um, so feel free to reach out to me uh, via email or, or for any any tips 
or anything. I, I love talking to people. So I'll try to give you any advice I can. Um, and you can also find me online. It's Julie Schur, S-C-H-U-R-R. Um, and um, I also got a website that I use. It's the same, coachjuliesure.com. So yeah, as long as you're looking up Julie and Schur, some combination of those, you're going to end up finding me. And if you put queer in front of that, you'll probably find me a lot faster. Because I think there's one other Julie Schur out there um, who is a gynecologist, ironically enough, and uh, she hates me. So I would just like to, I'm sure she absolutely hates me. So feel free to reach out um, with any questions you might have. I, I'd love to answer them for you um, or give you resources for the queer community as well um, or anything on grief. I'll try to dig things up for you. I have no issue just emailing that to people. Awesome. And we'll have all those links in the show notes as well. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Julie. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for everyone who's, who's listening. I am a cisgender heterosexual woman, colloquially cishet. I cannot conceive of the feelings or experiences my queer friends have endured or continue to endure in a world that keeps targeting them as others. I have loved and lost. I have loved and lost my best friend, my soulmate, my dog Shep. He was a source of unconditional love understanding and solace in a world that wasn't always accepting of me. Our pets are a sanctuary and they give us a home where we can be ourselves without fear or judgment. In a world that judges, in a world where our queer friends and family face discrimination, isolation, hate, and violence, their pets can bring a sense of belonging and acceptance. To lose them can be devastating. The world gives us little choice but to rise back up with resilience, and our friends and family in the queer community have overcome or are overcoming a unique set of challenges, all that come from simply living their truth. That resilience, born of the grieving process, is essential for healing, be you straight, gay, or trans. And we can all take a lesson in strength and resilience from our queer friends and family because they continue to rise up and face the roadblocks that society puts in front of them. With glitter. Tons and tons of glitter. My friends, love is love. Next week, I turn the mic over to Darlene Woodward of Panthetown Photography in Georgetown, Massachusetts. She's interviewing E.B. Bartels, author of Good Grief, Unloving Pets, here and hereafter. Until then. I'm Angela Schneider, owner of Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington, and your host at One Last Network, signing off to go get some Bella Snuggles. Listen to One Last Network on whichever podcast platform you prefer. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, and Amazon Music. Don't forget to hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode. If you have a friend who might be interested in our content, make sure you share us with them. Thanks for listening.